I can be the change. You, you can, can be, be the change. change. Together, we are the change. Together, we are the Welcome back to the 2020-2021 school year. Uh, my name is Dave Adderhold, Superintendent of Schools for the West Windsor Plainsboro Regional School District, and it's, it's a great honor uh, to, to welcome you to the start of what's uh, going to be a, a very interesting uh, and dynamic year as we head into the 2020-2021 school year. Um, we know that we are facing uh, some tremendous challenges as a school community um, and as a nation. And when we think about uh, re-entry and restarting our school year um, amid uh, a global health pandemic. Uh, we also obviously are facing difficult economic challenges as a nation, uh, but we also are facing a, a time period of uh, social injustices and uh, systemic racism. And today, as we welcome back to the 2020-2021 year, I'd like to spend some time focused in this convocation video uh, focus specifically around uh, efforts the district is making uh, and our hopes and aspirations for the future um, around structural inequalities, systemic racism, bias, stereotypes, discrimination, uh, and, and racism. And so let's talk a bit about what it means to be an anti-racist. And being an anti-racist is really talking about fighting against racism and taking Racism, of course, takes out several forms and works um, most in tandem with at least different types, at least one of these different types of racist ideas or behaviors or policies. So as a system, we need to be thinking about individual racism, looking at individuals, beliefs, attitudes, and actions, and the way in which those actions, beliefs, and attitudes are perpetuated in both conscious and unconscious ways. We need to be thinking about interpersonal racism or racism that are between individuals, such as slurs, biases, hateful actions. Um, and of course, then there's things like institutional racism and institutional racism that exists within organizations that are components of discriminatory treatments, unfair policies, biased practices that impact one race inequitably over others. And then there's structural racism. And these are overarching systemic racism beliefs across institutions and society. It gives privilege to one group, disadvantaging others. So as a school system, we're here to make a commitment to dismantling structures of systemic racism and making commitment to educating our students' hearts and, our, and their minds, confronting racism is not a political issue, confronting racism is a moral and ethical obligation. And we have a responsibility as a school system to uphold practices of being anti-racist. Our school district has continued partnerships and discussions with um, many members of our school community over the past several months. We're really proud of the discussions and conversations we've had with our students, uh, alumni, uh, members of the uh, African-American Parent Support Group, um, members of our PTAs and PTSAs, community members, administrators, members of our Board of Education. We we'll wanna talk a little bit about the opportunities that we have. You know, as we step into 2020, 2021, we have an opportunity to bring focus. We have an opportunity to provide voice. We have an opportunity to listen and hear one another. We have an opportunity to sit in discomfort. We have an opportunity to provide space. We have an opportunity to reflect and challenge our educational system. We have an opportunity to heal as a community, as a nation. We have an opportunity to come together. We have an opportunity to create safe spaces. But we also have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to disrupt and dismantle inequalities within our spheres of influence. And so that's something that we're gonna work really hard on, dismantling and disrupting inequalities within our sphere of influence. Uh, and to do that requires a collective conversation. Um, and as a school system, we're committed to making sure that we're making appropriate changes within our structures and our systems. We're committed to educating our students' hearts and minds, and we're con committed to confronting racism. Is no longer invisible. 
I think for a while it was hidden because people didn't have ways of seeing it. But now that people are recording it and um, speaking out about it more, we're able to understand and see what people are experiencing. Uh, side effect or result of the consequences of our country's success. Uh, there have been wonderful things that have been achieved in this country and wonderful institutions that have developed over the years, but they have come at the cost of a lot of suffering and pain of other people. It's overt and it's also insidiously pervasive. Largely unseen by Americans who aren't directly impacted by it on a daily basis. And since it's a blind spot, it allows people to argue in many cases that it doesn't exist at all, or that acknowledgements of racism are exaggerations. And that's obviously a problem, because if people aren't even able to see racism, there's no way that we're actually going to be able to address the impacts and fix it. Definitely more like a mixture of microaggressions and ignorance. I feel like a lot of the kids, they don't necessarily mean to be racist or come off racist, but they just haven't been educated or taught or understand that things that they say can come off a certain way, especially because people think that WWP is so diverse. Subtle, quite often invisible, but I think it's in, as prevalent and rooted as it is throughout the country. Most in racist jokes, and it's condoned by those by students and teachers that just let it happen because they aren't sure how to um, combat it and aren't sure how to um, say that this is just not okay. This is not something that we should condone. Present, and uh, one would think that with a lot of racial diversity and um, a lot of affluence and education that uh, we wouldn't have some of the problems that we deal with today. Diversity doesn't necessarily equate to racial harmony. Is a result of making assumptions about groups of people who live in our district. We have large demographic of students that some associate as having particular traits or qualities we have a tremendous success rate in our academics and achievements of students. I believe that people tend to assume things about people based on their ethnicities or their culture. It is really no different than it is anywhere else in the country. Although we might like to think that it is because we are more diverse than some of the other districts and communities. But even within the district, we've seen examples of individual acts of racism, particularly anti-blackness, um, as well as the effects of structural racism. So things like the disproportionate suspension rates and disproportionate enrollment for AP classes. So I think it's important for us in the community to remember that when racism is structural, it's everywhere, our district included. We're not exempt from this. I have learned during this unprecedented time period in our history that I am stronger than I thought. I mean, think about it. We are living through a pandemic and social unrest. And as a Black American, I know that we are not treated fairly, but I have never let that perception that someone might have of me that I'm not good enough never ever hold me back from reaching my highest potential. Is that I have to continue to build my own capacity and my own stamina around being uncomfortable. I can still help because I'm still, I can still be an ally and I can still show them like, hey, I might not be you and I might not understand your struggles, but I'm there for you and I'm willing to fight for you. An awareness of my own multi-ethnic background and all of the many facets of myself that I can relate to in other people. Being biracial myself, having experienced things from more than one lens, having gone through a life, feeling different ways about myself, sometimes because of being multiracial, has really um, brought to the surface for me some of my own experiences. Something I knew already, but I've delved into it a lot deeper, just how privileged I am. As I said, I was aware of this, but looking at what 
systemic racism really looks like and reading a lot more about it. Um, I think understanding what I was born into, um, all of the benefits that I've been afforded and how I've taken many of them for granted. Um, I think that this time in history has really shown light on something that I had only scratched the surface of. And I think something that I keep coming to is how much more learning I have to do. I have been thinking a lot more about the ways I've taught American history in the past. And I'm realizing that there are still more changes that I need to make. You know, I've always believed that as a social studies teacher, it's my responsibility to help the students become better citizens. And without having a clear understanding of racism, um, where it started, where it is today, the impacts of it on different groups in society, they're not going to be a good citizen in this country. I need to be more explicit in making sure that my students that go through my class understand. You know, we're asking me different ways I could be, um, they could be educated, different ways they could help. And it was just mostly, it was mostly like my friends that were people that are not of color. So that was just, that really stood out to me because it was just nice seeing like not only black people be, you know, aware of what's going on. Is how many people are willing to put in the work for the long run? I guess, um, just getting to see our community come together. I've never really, I've never experienced anything like it in my life. Um, peaceful protests in, uh, at West Windsor Community Park. And, and I have never seen so many people in our community in the same space fighting for the same thing and just wanting change in our community and, and fighting for each other and standing with each other and listening. Um, listening to the voices of young people. And then speak up when you see a wrong. Don't ignore it or turn a blind eye. What we have to do is become uncomfortable. We have to have uncomfortable conversations. We have to be in the presence of people that make us uncomfortable. We have to have those open and honest conversations as a community, and that's the only way we will move towards better change in West Windsor Homesboro. That we need to learn more in order to understand more. The community needs to just keep on coming out to protests and rallies and other forums and having difficult discussions and especially listening to the black community and um, learning about how the black community has experienced racism. While racism heavily affects black and brown communities, we all have a part to play in the fight against racism. Where uh, we're going to hear things that might be uncomfortable for us to hear, might even make us feel as if we've done some things incorrectly in the past that we need to now change. Um, but if we don't go down those paths, if we don't um, listen and act and change, um, we're not going to uh, we're not going to increase the awareness of the community. We're not going to change for future generations of students and, and, and people in our community. When I can support the fight for equality without making it about me, then I am being an ally. Very often we're asking the person who has been a victim of racism, the person who has experienced it, to be the voice for a race. I have to question myself, is that always fair, right? So I think an ally needs to be the person that speaks up and not always asking the, the person who's been victimized to have to relive um, an experience that was so negative to them. An ally, right? An ally is not a savior. An ally is someone who says, I'm here to fight alongside you, uh, do the work, listen more, and but be there to say, I stand up and I'm not going to be complicit to this work. If you're an ally, you take a stand by the side of me in the support of racial injustice. Your role is to respect me, understand my concerns, and understand my, why my community is fighting for a greater change. It is not your job as an ally to take over the fight. We are strong, we are confident, but what we need from you is advocacy and support, not control. It is a ever-evolving, lifelong journey that you have to take. It's important because there are some battles you cannot win, nor can you fight alone.
that once we recognize and acknowledge the, the racism within ourselves, our friends, and our communities, we can face the problem and work towards an authentic solution. So I think the importance of naming racism is that if you don't name it, you don't see it. Is acknowledging that so many uh, people face it, it's ugliness, um, and so many people deal with it every day. We have become way too comfortable not talking about racism and, you know, hearing people say, you know, why does everything have to be about race? Uh, once we recognize that racism is ubiquitous and it is, you know, a part of the fabric of our nation, our nation was built on a racist system of enslavement, uh, of race-based enslavement. And um, we, we have to recognize the problem before we can deal with it. Calling out racism calling it what it is, requires people to take action. When you call someone a racist, you better understand the implications of that word because racism in this society needs to be eradicated. Things I experienced personally, I've definitely let a lot of microaggressions slide, you know, random little comments here and there slide because, you know, I didn't want to come off as that person. I didn't want to come off as aggressive, you know, taking things out of context and things like that. But I feel like we really have to get over that and just call out like whatever we think is, um, you know, racist and just deal with it and address it or else it will never go away. As I said, I think you're seeing that um, around our country because young people are involved. If you're not careful and you watch enough uh, media attention, it's divisive because it puts you on one side or another. It gives us this awful choice. And the true fact of the matter is that, you know, two people from different places can have the same heart about an issue and not be torn because it separates, separates us by race or by ethnicity or by gender. We should be able to walk into a room if we have the same heart and the same mission and do that work and it not be pointed out, hey, James is a Black man. Change is with our children because adults, we don't have it right. The children in this community go to school together, they play together, and they don't see color. We have a myriad of races here. But as adults, we're teaching them what racism is. There's hope for change everywhere. I see hope for change in everything, everything I uh, look at. You know, I, I see it in the media. I see it in what I'm able to discern for myself. Because I see our youth speaking up, and I see our youth speaking out. by talking about racism, injustice, inequities um, head on and early on. I don't think it's ever too early to have these conversations, um, you know, even at the preschool, kindergarten level. Develop a classroom atmosphere in which students of color feel comfortable listening to students' experiences and their concerns without being defensive. And I think that that part is really key because you're going to shut down any moments, potential moments of sharing by becoming defensive. And you're also going to shut down your own learning by doing that. Uh, educate yourself about <clears throat> students of color. Um, and when you do that, then you know that uh, the way you speak, the things you accept in a classroom, the, the readings that you choose, how you lesson plan makes a huge difference. Uh, how we decorate a room or set the room up can speak volumes to whether you're really accepting of people from all races and all genders. They're very uncomfortable. They're anxious going into class. And although uh, they may not always recognize overt racism or overt um, issues or incidents that take place, they have a sense because many times they're the only one of color in a classroom. In my role as a leader, I have to make sure it's a safe space, right? So I think that we need to make sure it's safe to have those conversations. We need to structure it in a way, though, where um, everyone feels safe. You go into teaching because, hopefully, you care about kids, right? Our students are at the center of every single thing that we do. It, it's just that. Like, I just think that if you're not willing to do the work, then you shouldn't be doing this job anymore. This is, you know, it's been 30, 32 years in education, and we haven't.
done enough. And if I'm willing to keep learning and keep growing, then and to model that and to be that, then I expect my teachers and my colleagues to do the same. There's still great work to be done. 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 Work to be done. And it's up to each one of us. You and I are partners. John Lewis. There's still work left to be done. So as we as we come together in, in conclusion of this year's convocation, let me just again offer um, the health, wellness, and safety to all our school community. We take great pride in being a community that cares about one another, that has a dedicated focus to instructional excellence, has a dedicated focus to the social emotional well-being of our students and our staff. While we are um, in the midst of a, a very difficult pandemic, um, I just ask that you all take precautions to take care of each other, to keep each other safe, to, to honor the safety practices that we're putting forward as a school community uh, to ensure the health and wellness of, of all members of our school community. I, I wish you all a, a tremendous school year. We look forward to supporting our students and our staff and our community through this time. All my best wishes uh, to each of you for a wonderful 2021 school year. Thank you.